Welcome to uh, the first workshop of our speaker series, Means of Production. I'm Marusia Basirkov. I'm Associate Professor of Media Theory in RTA School of Media and Director of the Studio for Media Activism and Critical Thought. Uh, we work to blur the boundaries between media art making, activism, and theoretical and scholarly investigation. Uh, we host an annual speaker series, well, sort of, sort of annual. The last one was, was last winter, so this is like practically twice annually, as well as courses that look critically at the global media scape through uh, the intersectional framework of gender, sexuality, race, and class. Um, and you can read about us more in our flyer, which is available outside uh, the bookmark, announcing the rest of the series, as well as our website. One of our courses, RTA 893 Social Justice Media, is linked to this speaker series. I'm hearing a repeat, but is that just me hearing it? Okay, sounds good. Um, uh, uh, and uh, the students of RTA 893 are here tonight in the front rows, and they're going to be live blogging the event. Um, the, the blog will be linked to our web page. Did I tell you guys that? <laughs> it's going to be publicly available. I did say it was a public writing assignment. Um, uh, so, uh, so that blog will be available uh, shortly. The event's also being recorded for podcasts, so uh, th those who are unable to attend can watch the event on video and that'll, that won't be live, that'll take a week or two to come up on the site. And you can also catch all of the lectures in our last speaker series on the site. Um, and just a heads up that this series continues into, through November, um, so please mark your calendars for our next event, Aboriginal activist and media maker Raven Sinclair talking about Aboriginal community media and film, uh, and a film she's making about the 60s scoop. That'll be October 20th. And, um, and also, if you haven't um, signed up for our email list, please do so, and we will definitely uh, get that information to you again. Um, and also, students who are here will be inviting you to come on board to, to the studio with your ideas and energy at our first studio media activist meeting on October 28th, and we're gonna lure you with free pizza and uh, initiate discussion about how you'd like to expand the space for media activism at Ryerson. Um, uh, Tari Nangura, the newest member of our team. Tari, <coughs> say hello. Um, we'll be visiting your classes to tell you more about the studio for media activism and how you can be involved. Um, this series, which brings together some of this city's and this country's best thinkers and makers of social justice media, was curated together with the really talented grad students and scholars on my team, Amy Siegel and Sydney Tiber. Say hello, Amy and Sydney. Um, and I also want to thank the Learning and Teaching Office for their generous support through the Teaching Diversity Fund, as well as FCAD, RTA, and the technical staff of RTA for their support. The title of this series is Means of Production. As many of you know, it's a, it's a Marxist term that refers to the tools and raw materials of labor owned in Marx's time by wealthy factory and landowners. These days, means of production can still mean a factory, like the tomato factories worked by Mexican migrant laborers in southern Ontario that Min Sukli introduced us to at last winter's speaker series. Or it can mean the corporate-owned social media platforms where we alternately post our cat videos or organize revolutions. Or the consolidated Canadian media in industry where we may wish to have more of those stories of Canadian migrant labor told in a more accountable way. So in this context, I'm really happy to introduce Eliza Chandler who will teach us how to seize the means of production by creating digital stories from her experience as a disability arts activist. Eliza Chandler is the Ethel Louise Armstrong Postdoctoral Fellow in the School of Disability Studies here at Ryerson. She's a practicing disability artist. She also sits on the board of Tangled Art and Disability. She's the president of the Canadian Disability Studies Association and is the co-director of the Disability Arts Community Group Project Creative Users. 
Eliza Chandler has written that, quote, disability is discursively produced through ableist logic under the regime of truth, wherein discrimination against disabled people makes sense. But she also writes about, quote, opening up desire for what disability disrupts, end quote. In that hopeful spirit of disruption, disruption and desire, please join me in welcoming Dr. Eliza Chandler. Disability Pride March, which has been host, hosted by the school for a number of years, 
and is happening this Saturday at 1 o'clock, I believe. 1 o'clock. Um, and scholarship uh, um, at the bottom. So, so being positioned at the school allows me to um, interrogate artistic means of production as something um, that deserves um, critical inquiry. And disability arts right now, as I'll talk about, is in a, a time of fast development. We're being funded by arts councils. Um, our artists are giving tremendous opportunity to produce art when we hold disability arts events. The, um, our audience numbers are swelling and overwhelming our, our spaces at some times. Um, and there's been a real demand um, across Ontario for all cultural institutions, galleries, theaters, museums, to become more accessible in their curatorial and programming practices. And there's also a desire which, again, was sort of first emerged in the School of Disability Studies to chronicle and document disability arts history. So in all of these ways, disability is really rampant. Disability art is really at a time of, um, of, of plenty, I guess. And, and I'm in the really fortunate position to, to take a seat as the artistic director at Tangled just as this, the, the tide is turning. So I recognize that I am benefiting from all the labor and all the years and all the passion that came before me. But as we've seen with other activist movements, when, when activist art gets, gets going and picks up public interest, I think in that very moment is a really critical time to offer critical inquiry and reflection into what's going on. Anyone who's worked in nonprofit sector knows that when you're on the front line, so to speak, as the artistic director of Tangled, I mean, I'm constantly occupied with, with um, really issues of survival, that, that it is a real gift that I am forever grateful to be able to come into Ryerson and reflect on what's going on. And this talk really does offer that reflection. So let's start, what is disability culture? So I, I and more than culture, um, I, I want to talk, I want to begin um, by sort of addressing an unanswerable question, a hotly political question right now. What is disability art? For me, disability art um, might be just distinguishable from art produced by disabled people. To me, disability art is political at its core. It's produced or directed or um, initiated by a disabled person. It need not be about the experience or representation of disability, but as I'll get to, I think it, should, it needs to engender some sort of disability aesthetics and it needs to be curated or programmed directed in an accessible way. So as, as your media, media um, students, you know, any video that we produce as disability artists needs to, of course, be captioned. And emerging practices of body description are making media and other artistic forms even more accessible. Um, so to me, that's what disability arts is. For Rose Jacobson and Jeff and Birchie, disability arts is a vibrant and richly varied field in which artists with disabilities create work that expresses their identities as disabled people. Um, disability cult, I think I'm, forgive my Edward slides. So turning to Catherine Brzee, who was um, the founding director of the School of Disability Studies, who we still um, look to for guidance all the time, describes disability art as this, and this is a, a definition that I find myself more closely aligned with. Not all of disability art is explicitly about the disability experience, but all of it, I would suggest springs from, from disability experience. 
and to be appreciated must be seen and heard with all of its historic and biographical <laughs> resonance. Our encounters with the art of disability, we are called upon to know the heart of the matter, to hold up the mirror, to hear the overtones. And I'll come back to you at this end, at the end when we go into um, the future um, of, of, of disability culture. Controversy holds dis disabled people do not seek merely to participate in Canadian culture. We want to create it, shape it, stretch it beyond its tidy edges. And for me, this is really animating all of the work that I'm presenting today as disabled artists. We don't um, simply wish to integrate ourselves into an, an ableist, inaccessible way of producing and curating art. We want our inclusion in art to shape it, to stretch it beyond, beyond its tidy edges. So we want things that we, we want things like funding that, that, won't, that won't disrupt um, ODSP payments. And, and we don't want accommodation for how we might receive funding that doesn't disrupt our RDSP payments, and I'll back up a little bit. So one of um, the, the issues that Tangled Arts really is advocating around is the fact that if one is on OD, uh, Ontario Disability Support Program, which is more than a, um, more than a, a menial monthly income, but also provides extended health benefits, which are very important. Um, if, if I am to receive um, above $2,000 in a year, I'm kicked off of OTSP. So this is an intensely um, unjust and, and, and prohibitive structure, which, which um, precludes a lot of disabled artists from accessing funding. So um, we don't want to be incorporated into a, an arts ecology that works to exclude us. We recognize that that's a broken system. And we want to, to um, work to create new practices which are, which are better for, for everyone. That, that was a little aside, but this, this really is animating what, what I'm thinking about here. And I'll, ref I'll return to this definition when I talk about disability aesthetics. Whatever one's definition of disability arts is, this sector clearly has a strong connection to reframing the meaning of disability. Disability arts and culture has always been an integral arm of the disability rights movement both mobilizing and challenging its main call, call to action. Taking heed of the disability rights movement's main tenet, the disability rights of human rights, disability arts and culture claims that full and effective participation in society requires, requires more than barrier-free access to public spaces and buildings. We must have full access and meaningful participation in all areas of life, including um, into arts, arts and culture, both as producers and creators, as well as artists, I'm sorry, audience members and participants. The disability arts and culture movement makes the representation of disabled people a political issue for how it asserts that in order for disabled people to be truly liberated, we must change the way that, that, that society understands us. And I think this is the work of the artist. And in a culture which tells us in insidious and explicit ways that disabled people's access to life and to, to the future is debatable, how disability and disabled people are represented is hotly political. So since the 1980s, um, the dis um, I'm going to skip a little bit. So since the 1980s, um, the disability arts and culture movement has been an important part of disability rights in North America and the United Kingdom. This movement emer first emerged in the UK in the 1970s alongside other rights-based movements 
such as the women's movements, the civil rights movement, the queer liberation movement, and they moved into the U.S. and Canada in the 1980s. Death, and ma de death disability, and mad arts and cultures organizations appeared in Canada as early as 1973, um, it, so in the U.S. And, and early in the 1980s in Canada. Um, in the late, in the early 2000s, disability arts emerged as, as its own distinct practice by disability identified artists. Disability arts festivals emerged around this time too, and in Canada, Ryerson's 2001 launch of Arts with Attitude, an evening of disability arts and culture, is widely recognized as the first public showcasing of disability arts in Canada. Of the importance of disability arts to the disability rights movement, Jeanne Abbas writes, at L writes, and this was a, produce, a report produced on disability and deaf arts in Canada, produced by the Ryerson School of Disability Studies. They write, the emergence of disability culture and the importance of art, art, art forms and representations in this culture must be seen as a natural extension to the disability rights movement. And the disability arts movement is essentially about the growing political power of disabled people over their own narrative, their own image and narrative. The, um, founding arts events and festivals here at Ryerson um, laid the groundwork for the emergence of a disability culture throughout Canada, which includes um, later Vancouver's Kickstarts Festival and Calgary's Balancing Arts Festival, which, um, which launched soon after the Arts of Attitude. Yet even even then, there was an absence of there was an absence of disability arts from cultural discourse in Canada, a virtual absence of statistics regarding deaf and disabled art sectors, and 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 a dearth of specific disability arts government funding pools, and artists living with disability were were largely absent from funding panels. So, for, so following the animating slogan, nothing about us without us, this movement is, or perhaps should be, distinctly disability-led. And I do want to spend just a, a brief moment on this point. More than being socially responsible, having disability-led disability arts organizations is politically important for the movement. Um, for the way that such leadership and direction and, and does ableist assumptions that disabled people lack agency, leadership skills, and even intention. Assumptions that the disability arts movement um, is, is trying to, to disrupt. The relationship between disability and art has historically been interpolated through a therapeutic lens judging art produced by disabled people as, product, as products of therapy produced without intention or knowledge of artistic canons. Such an inter interpretation of art inspired of an entire art movement known as the art group, art group movement or outsider art movement, which was defined as art created outside of the boundaries of official culture. So by this definition, we we can see the importance of defining a disability arts culture as itself undoing, undoing these historical ways of, of qualifying art produced by disabled people. Um, and, and more than a movement, the, the art group movement established a, a public pedagogy or understanding for how to interpret, classify, include, fund and curate art produced by disabled people. And in turn, these assumptions and power, these, these assumptions and power relations are what disabled artists and curators are constantly working against. Even when disability is not read through the lens of art therapy, the idea that of disabled people doing art has not been, 
sorry, has, the idea of disabled people doing art has always proved irresistible to um, charitable cases. Um, and still today there is power relations relevant to the division between disability identified artists and non and non-disabled art presenters. Ableist assumptions about the relationship between disability and art continue to inform important practices that hope that disability arts must rail against. Practices that suggest that disabled artists are not professional artists such as not paying artists, um, not encouraging disabled people's art practice to develop, not recognizing disability arts as a canon through which disability arts can be um, interpreted, not excessively curating art shows. Um, the worst example um, that I encountered in recent years was turning up to a disability art show only here in Toronto only to discover that the artist's names were not attached to the work. We, we can and we should critique the categorization of professional artists for, for the ableist structures which work to keep dis disability identified artists out of this category. Um, but I also think it's politically important to defi define um, disability artists in a professional way because this provides access to funding and exhibition opportunity, as well as undoing ableist assumptions that disability art is only exceptional in spite of itself, um, only identifiable as exceptional by a non-disabled curator or programmer. All of these practices are indications that the cultural landscape of disability arts is continuously threatened by arts institutions and charitable organizations that seek to promote disability arts while dismissing its political base. These practices um, are, I'm going to skip that part. Um, so, so, moving ahead, and <clears throat> in all kinds of ways, and to quote Eli Clare, just as a body has been stolen, they can also be reclaimed. So in, in spite of this long, um, laborious history that I just read to you, there is um, phenomenal disability art being produced. Um, that, that works in conversation with the ableist assumptions that, that, lay, that established the discursive regime which came before us. One quick example. Is, um, this is a Toronto-based artist, Jess Sash, um, in, in their series, American Able. Um, and she, you can recognize this visual form as mimicking American apparel ads, which are on the box of now magazines, which um, typically picture um, a, a sort of normatively beautiful, um, quote unquote, um, passive, passively um, positioned woman who's sort of looking defeatist. Um, but we, we know that we know this this icon or this image as something which um, which promotes a, a normative understanding of desire. So by occupying this this these images with um, their genderqueer visibly crept body, um, I think Jeff is daring us to look at their body and and maybe um, confront the des desire that is produced when we look at this body. Um, the, this series was con commissioned by the Contact Photography um, Festival a few years ago in 2006 and appeared on the LCD screens um, in all of the subway platforms for, for just over a week. And I think really by positioning this disability Political art in, this, in these public spaces, um, Jess, Jess was working to undo some of these evil assumptions. But as I'll get to, there still are risks to this kind of work. So this, I think, is a good time to, t to speak um, about tangled art plus disability. Um, the, the, um, 
the organization dedicated to cultivating disability art, um, of which I am artistic director. Um, so in 2003, um, we, we underwent a significant sort of revitalization, which included um, a, a name change, so formally we were the Abilities Arts Festival. With the name change came this new branding or, the, or this new logo, and it also was accompanied by a change in leadership structure, which allowed me to, to get my position as artistic director, um, distinguishing our organization from others as being um, disability-led. Uh, what we do at Tangled is complicated, and our sort of slogan is, a tangled is not a knot. It can be undone or remain happily tangled. Tangles are messy and imperfect, but they are also complex, intricate, organic, even deliberate. Tangles represent what this organization does. We bring together all kinds of people and practices. So I'm, I'm sort of pausing in the trajectory of my talk just to sort of bring you um, an example of how disability art can be done differently, can be led differently, can be curated differently, can be supported in a different way, way that um, again doesn't easily fold into normative ways of doing arts culture, but it, I think um, um, is, is working to change arts ecology in, in Canada. Um, these are some of the events that we, that we produced over the past year. Um, ranging from, from dance to activism to film screening um, to our Strange Beauty Festival, which um, filled the, uh, the iconic um, hub of contemporary art in Toronto, um, the, the 401 Richmond Building, um, which I think directly led um, Tangled into securing our own space um, to, to have a, a gallery on the main floor. Um, it's opening in April, but we have a soft opening with a pop-up show on, on Saturday at 7 p.m. And the Bent Newman graduate at the school um, is, is opening her Visualizing Absence um, show, which is an activist art show at its core, core um, remembering the histories of the Lakeshore Psychiatric Institution. These are just a few examples of work produced by um, produced by Tangled as part of Strange Beauty. This is evidence that we, we really did fill the building with all kinds of different bodies. You see all sorts of people crowded in, into this hallway, including some arts officers. Um, this is a piece by Barbara Green Mann um, that will be showcased in the vitrines um, on the second level of the She building as part of Social, Je Social Justice Week um, starting next week. And this image, I really love it because it also shows another thing that I think we do well at Tangled, um, which is we, we're of course committed to producing accessible accessible shows that are accessible for everyone. But this, this image shows how we can and you can too go beyond best practices of hiring um, ASL interpreters. Of course, that's what we do at any, sh at any show. But through a conversation I had with a deaf person last winter, I, I learned that, in fact, when events are scripted like me, like, um, musical shows, poetry readings, plays, etc. anything that has a script, you can in fact, and this is obvious once I say it, but it didn't occur to me, hire a deaf sign language interpreter. So a deaf person gets a script, they translate that script from English or French into ASL, and then they use that script to interpret events. They usually work in tandem with a hearing interpreter who might help them with their pacing, um, give them cues as to um, speed up and slow down. But this has been such an important development in Tangled's practices because 
Not only does it allow us to hire more disabled people, more people from the disability community, but the quality of an interpretation that you get from an ASL first language speaker is noticeable, noticeable to the deaf community, right? So that's part of um, creating a, a space where we don't simply tolerate um, difference, but we desire. We're constantly thinking about how we can produce um, programs that are, that are welcoming to difference. Okay, finally, we're going to get to some art. So I thought a lot about how to talk to you all about the importance of media activism, but then I figured you probably know it, so we're going to skip over that part. But I mean, just very briefly, I mean, I think media activism has the potential for us to produce um, multipli uh, a multiplicity of disabled images. So our project with disability arts and media activism is not simply replacing a, a, bad, a, a bad disabled image with a, with a good disabled image, but we're trying to open, open up the category to lots of different ways that we can, we can that we experience disability, which I think digital stories is, is very effective at, at doing. Um, depending on your crowd, they can be very um, circulatable, they can go viral. Of course, I, I recognize that not everyone has access to a computer, but I think um, especially these days, it, it can be, there is a form of digital democracy that happens bringing media art out of, out of the gallery. And when we think of online communities in relation to the disability community, this can be a space where communities across space happen when it can be difficult for lots of different reasons to leave houses and being online can be a more effective way of connecting and getting access to art. Um, but there are also risks that, that, I, that I want to talk about too. And I talked a little bit about risk when I talked about Jeff Sash's American Able ad. I think that as disabled people, representing our, our disability by our own terms can be revolutionary. But as any artist will tell you, once you produce art and sort of release it into the world, you no longer have direction over how that art gets interpreted. Um, so if I produce something with the intention to disrupt ableist understandings, that might very well be read as confirming ableist understandings, right? Um, and when I say we have no control over how art is produced, I, I think yes and no. I'm, I was trained um, at NASCAD in a traditional way of um, thinking about art, and we were told never to be didactic with our art and our curatorial practices. So on the one hand, I sort of abide by that forever. But on the other hand, I do think that there is such a risk with disability art that it can, um, it can open itself up to violence to, to make no fine point about it, that we might be able to curate disability art in a distinctly crypt way. We can crypt or, or um, work with difference in, in the way that we curate things to sort of guard against or mediate against um, violence as much as we can. So this is a contentious issue, but I do think th things like offering um, artist statements, curatorial statements, and, and having those be in plain language, having things like artist talks be a part of all of your um, art shows can, can be not only a way to sort of move disability culture forward, but also can provide a platform for sort of grappling with, um, with the political intention around art, which you know, historically is a big no-no, but I, I think it, it might, we, might, um, we might need to do that. Um, so 
So I think what I'll do, I'll, I'll show a digital story, which, I sash, which, um, which really shows how digital media can, can be a form of, of activism by, by allowing the artists to represent themselves by their own terms. And it's, um, I, I think you'll all enjoy it. I hope so. And then I'll switch off of my PowerPoint and try to open up a video that I've been trying to caption, but everything's crashing. But hopefully that will play. And that's, that's uh, I think, a much um, more complicated media image of disability. Because what you, maybe I'll frame that after we watch Jess's video. So I'll pause and I'll, I'll frame what we see in the next video, um, which is kind of repossessing risk um, when we get there. So forgive my um, clumsiness. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Mary Oliver. Body Language by Jess Sash. Since the day my spine was fused as a child, it has been resisted beneath my flesh. I decided to pose naked on this crane. I was, and I am, just like you. I feel. I laugh. I love. I grow. When you tell me that I'm brave, don't believe I'm not scared. I was scared that day, the day I tore my clothes off and started taking pictures. To understand, you need to know that I never did this, let you see me naked. I never let me see me naked. But I needed to find what everyone was staring at. So that day I looked. Hard, long, frame after frame, alone, scarred, beautiful. Are you scared? I'm scared each day I try to love myself completely. To understand, you need to know that this is everything. I want you to be scared. I want you to look at these photos and see you. And I want you to imagine loving it all. Every bowl, every scar. The final photograph closes in on an image of a tattoo on her chest, an outline of a heart with a ribbon and the word crooked. For Peterborough. Envisioning new meanings of disability and difference. Okay, so that um, obviously was an example of a digital story. This next video that I'm going to pull up is um, a video um, which shows the art of Lisa Bufana. So, okay, so this shows the, um, the art of Lisa Bufana who as you'll learn through watching the video, um, is a, um, was a, dis a disability identified artist. Um, just 
to do what I'm not supposed to do, to give you a little bit of um, a frame of reference for what you're about to watch. And I'm, I'm repeating it, but just so that you are tuned into what you're about to see. Um, Lisa is um, participating in an artist in residence program, and as part of the program, the artist is given uh, um, the window gallery, which is what it sounds like, a gallery which um, which looks out onto the street. So the intention is to sort of blur um, blur boundaries and bring art into the public sphere um, in, antici in anticipation that the artist might attract um, non-art non gallery goers. Um, so what you'll see is Lisa performing her art. Um, she is being filmed for the purpose of documentation by an artistic collaborator who's standing outside of the gallery under the street, just filming her. And what what um, the videographer unintentionally um, captures is two passerbyers walking by and um, discussing Lisa and her artwork. And just if I can be even more pedagogical for a second, um, I wanted to think about um, this idea of risk, right? So I've, I've explained why I think disability art is so powerful and necessary for mobilizing disability justice. But I also want, but as I said, the, the, um, the legacies of how disability and art have been understood through, through things like outsider art, um, they're still with us and there's still things that disability artists need to gra or, or um, have to gra grapple with all of the time. I mean, I think this video really does a nice job of, of showing the risk that we engage when we make our bodies public, but also how um, we might be able to repossess risk. And I won't give my insights as to that until after we've had some time for a small group discussion. So it's only about a minute, so here we go. So, um, does anyone need me to play it again? To get, yeah, okay. Person 
it without arms and fingers as it's described in the video. She's actually made herself table legs, which she uses as prosthesis, and she dances on those prosthesis. So in this video you see her, um, again, beyond the window of the gallery, dancing in this very slow way of sort of um, emerging from the ground and, and twisting around it. And it's in the video shot like sort of a shaky camera and the whole thing's pretty dimly lit. And you do see two women going up to the window and then backing away when the camera person says, I'm, I'm an artist. piece um, takes as its title that, that phrase, mentally fine, that's called mentally fine. Um, so I guess in um, small group discussions, um, if you wouldn't mind talking about um, both of the videos and thinking about how media arts as activism can potentially help us to reclaim re, um, representation images over disability, but also how um, we do engage risk. And, and, um, and I would push you to think about, as, as I've been pushing myself to think about, how the risk that we um, open us up to as disabled artists can potentially, um, we can use that risk to our advantage. Uh, so maybe five minutes, ten minutes, five minutes. And if anyone wants to come up and hear the video um, closer to the computer, uh, say, come on up. Um, so what were the things that small groups talked about, and is that okay? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to run a mic, run a mic as well. Um, so we're just talking about how like the two videos were similar in certain ways as in it's kind of this person just putting themselves out there and letting the world see them for who they are. But the difference between the two is that in the first one with American Able, it was kind of um, described in a sense. So you know exactly what her message is and what the point 
of her doing that was. So you really understood what, where she was coming from, kind of like an art, art statement, like what you were talking about before, that that should be something that um, artists could get the chance to include in their work. But then with the second one, it was a little different because she was totally just there. It was just her. There was no explanation, and it just generated this whole type of curiosity. And at some point, it kind of seemed like negative curiosity, like with the comments they were making, like, oh, like, was she born that way? Is this, like... And it was just like questions that you're kind of like, are you actually like asking these questions right now? So it's like on a whole different level. You were also talking about like power relations because you had mentioned that before. And it's kind of like, yeah, like these people are judging them. Like they feel like they have the sense of power that I can make uh, judgments and I can just kind of assess somebody based on their physical appearance. But you don't necessarily understand how they react to that on their side. So that's what we talked about. Fantastic. Anyone want to add to that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, just to build on that, we thought it was really interesting over here how um, the American Able ad wasn't, um, it was kind of like you've touched on before, it wasn't a comment on disability or her struggle with disability, but it was also like multi-layered it included kind of a commentary on uh like popular culture um sexuality we talked about so it it, it was a multi-layered um piece of art it wasn't just a comment on her being disabled so we we thought that was a really interesting look at it that's great thank you um maybe a third comment in the back I can't remember where I picked this up. It's not my original plan finder. Um, Michelle was then on oh, my phone. Hi, I'm Thunder, <laughs> aka Michelle Rosano on the internet. Hook me up on Facebook. I'm a counselor and advocate and uh, a multidisciplinary artist. Um, what I found uh, somewhere else, it's not my original catch thunder doing a rap some other time or wedging the karma magician. Um, I heard somewhere in the last couple months that humans are one of the, something like, okay, maybe not correct, but I bring injury. I fabricate. <laughs> uh, humans are one of the only, one of, one of some of the species that uh, judge people's color, okay? And also, I don't want to use the word see, but people, it seems, judge by difference of what a quote uh, normal more what what the a person's body should, you know is supposed to be like to what two leggeds are supposed to be like so they not we not only judge by color the four colors I mean white red yellow black but we also judge by someone's difference, someone's disability, or someone that you don't think look fits in your you know what I mean? In yeah. in, in this in yeah. this in the square. So in I, this circle. That's excellent. So I think I don't know how to express No, that, that was really beautiful. Thank I, you. I, I think what all three comments really highlighted and uh, I'm so happy that I was able to get um, uh, that you agree with me I guess but but or, or that you notice that the in disability art as these two quite different videos um, represent we're always engaging with the idea that ours are bodies that are going to be noticed and and various ways, whether that's stared at, paused at, um, managed, 
criminalized in all kinds of ways. Our bodies are the kinds of bodies that get noticed. And Jess's video, um, it, it was my mistake, but this isn't part of their American Apparel, or sorry, um, American Able um, artwork. This is the predecessor to that artwork. And we'll see some more, some newer artwork by Jess in a little bit. And, and I think that, um, that this, well, if Jess is here, they would tell you that this digital story marked sort of a, an important beginning point for their practice. This idea of grappling with, as, as they put it, trying to find out what everyone else is looking at. And we also see Lisa Bufano, um, th that she is a body that is looked at or noticed, comes through in her work. Um, her work cannot avoid that. And I think both artists um, work with the knowledge that there is a kind of body that will be noticed. So especially, as was said, in the Lisa Bufano video, we could think about her as, as opening herself up to risk um, and, and sort of getting herself into a situation where that she doesn't want to be in. But as somebody who myself gets noticed and stared at quite a bit, I'm willing to guess that Lisa knew what was going to happen if she appeared in a window gallery. Uh, I, I'm willing to guess she knew that she would be stared at. Um, and that is risky. But also, in both cases, these aren't artists who have to worry about going unnoticed or not, attract, not garnering um, a, an audience. They have an audience. And even behind the frame or the window pane, I think that these artists both show us that they are in control over their representation, even yeah. at the very moment that it's being objectified. So those women are, uh, you know, I think it's pretty clearly ableist. The, and and uh, I mean, the video is so pedagogically perfect because it, Highlights all of the what all of the things that disabled artists um, have to contend with. So the very first question asked of her body was, "Is she a human?" So the, so that's where we're starting from. Are we human, right? And then it goes on in, inquiries. Um, was she born that way? You know, uninvited questions. Um, and then I think one of the final thought, oh, and then of course that sanest remark, mentally fine, you know, and, and well, as long as her mind's intact, you know, we can forgive her disabled body, and of course we, we can understand that as, as a sanest remark. Um, and then the final remark, which to me the most um, irksome, I think, was, did she come up with that idea herself? So, so I mean, these are the issues that we're grappling with as disabled artists. Are we human? Are we gendered? Are we creative? What's our problem? What's our story? Why isn't the art satisfying what that story is? Why is it keeping us lingering with our questions? But in the midst of all of that trouble, I think we do have an opportunity to engage um, in a risk that we're likely uh, always already engaging when we occupy public space. Um, so, so those are just a few thoughts. Jeremiah. Yeah, and I was going to say, it's interesting folks went to the American Able piece, right? That's, how you got, that's where the recognition was. And I think it speaks to the power of culture jamming as well, something we haven't totally yeah. discussed, but that's also, I think, really relevant to, to media activism, right? Like shifting that dominant image around, reclaiming it, Right, and, and oftentimes that's something that really sticks with you because you have that context to what American Able was before, right? Was it was a was American Apparel, and that's kind of the project too. Mad Arts, Crip Arts too. It's like when you take a word that people know already and switch it around, it, it, it sticks. So it I think sticks. it's a good example yeah. in terms of the context of this uh, of the work that we. Absolutely, that's great. Okay, well. Um, Without further, actually, I did have a summary slide that I'll put up. So, um, I think digital media, oh, sorry, disability media works as digital activism because it disrupts the assumption that we, disabled people, 
are positive and non-agentive. Further to that, I think in disrupt the assumption that disability art is only therapy, um, and more so than any, any, any other sort of art. I mean, anyone could argue that their art practice um, contributes to their overall well-being, I would suppose. Um, by perpetuating many stories of disability, which media art allows us to do, we disrupt, um, we disrupt the single story of disability. Um, disability arts is part of a disability community, and that community and that history, I think, demonstrates a vitality, a creativity, and a, and a dy dynamism of disability as this artwork is community generated and it is sustained, it is um, a, um, engaged with um, through a desire for disability rather than a desire to eliminate it. Um, and I think, and I'll get into what I mean more explicitly about desiring disability. Um, de desiring disability and telling new stories of disability is a political act. So, um, my main question um, the, um, during my postdoc so far is, I know that disability art um, is linked to vitality, right? I know that when we are represented as artists, we're represented as, as vital. And as I'll get into at the final point of my talk, the, the vitality of disability is always called, is, always in so many ways, the vitality of my people is always called into question. And, and the, when we talk about risks, those are some risks, right? So I think that there is some connection between um, the power dis disability has to, to represent not only a history, but a culture, a language, and our practice. Um, and that does a lot of work in, in um, um, driving home the understanding of disabled people as a personhood rather than a disparate group of individuals who happen to live with a problem and that problem is one that is in need of solution. Disability arts, disability activism and studies too, but I think disability arts is um, highly effective at, at um, and, and doing assumptions that we are not vital. And in, in recent times, especially with the Carter decision, which, um, which uh, allows for a physician assisted suicide, I mean, claims over disability vitality um, are, are um, not only necessary, but I would say urgent. It brings me to disability aesthetics. I just feel like I need to rearrange. Okay. Um, so, so I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about developing disability aesthetics because I think its emergence signifies the growth of an art sector beyond arts for activism's sake, which I've been talking a lot about. As disability art is typically, I would suggest, taken up in disability studies, only mentioned uh, um, as an activist activity, which I think it is, I think it's political at its core, but I think we can theorize um, disability art a little bit more closely by paying attention to the aesthetics that it engenders. Um, moreover, I think theorizing disability aesthetics through aesthetic theory um, and the one that I'm using right now is the one put forth by John Rockford here in his Politics of Aesthetics, may animate a connection, one that I've been wondering about for quite some time, between disability art, aesthetics, and, and crip and mad futurity. So let's start with the definition of aesthetics and work our way through to futurity. <clears throat> Um, I'm working with a theorist named Tobin Sievers who um, wrote a book called Disability Aesthetics that I would really re recommend um, picking up. Um, Tobin Sievers writes um, that aesthetics, just aesthetics, we're not a disability aesthetics yet, is, 
is concerned with the emotional experience of um, satiation or taste. So how we emotionally respond to a form and whether or not we judge that form as, as um, satiating us or not. So we can see that this is not an, that aesthetics is not only an emotional experience, but of course it's one that's highly subjective. But for these reasons, I think, for the reasons that um, dis disability tends to elicit emotion, um, disability art has been included. Dis dis um, disabled bodies and forms have been included throughout art history. So when we think of the problem of, of disability in art, the problem is not that representations are, are erased from art history, but it's the way that, that these aesthetics have been taken up. So everyone from Chagall to Magritte to, of course, Diane Arbus has animated disability for its aesthetic purpose. And they do so, I think, and by the way, so the way that these artists and more have talked about their work by separating out form, um, form from politics. So, so engaging and representing disability as, as something of um, an unusual or anomalous form without um, tying their art to or locating their art in any political struggle. So, so it's objectifying disability. Um, so truly, object, truly objectified, disability was turned into an aesthetic producing object through its freakification, while the art in which it was included was not at all concerned with advancing disability rights or changing social understanding of disability. The inclusion of disability art in this way works to confirm and also perpetuate the understandings of disability as desirable only for its utter otherness. And, and this is produced in, in all kinds of in all kinds of ways. Um, so disability aesthetics then turns the ways and the reasons for disabilities been included in art onto its head. Um, instead, instead of this, disability aesthetics prizes physical and mental difference a significant value in itself. It refuses to recognize the healthy body or the healthy mind as the sole determination of the aesthetic. And that's by Sievers. Oh, sorry, the, the quote is cut off a little bit. So um, I think this disability aesthetics is an indication of a developing art sector, as I said, because it signifies that disability art can be identifiable through more than a thematic. This is to say that through disability aesthetics, we might begin to imagine a category of disability art as opening up to art that doesn't necessarily represent disability or mad embodiment or experience, but engenders a particular set, expanding set of aesthetics. So let's work through some examples. Um, the first example um, that, I, that I want to talk about is, so both examples I want to think through what a disability aesthetics could be that finds value in difference and is satiated by difference. The first example is from my own artistic practice, which extends into being a facilitator at digital storytelling workshops through a project called Project Revision, um, which seeks to reimagine images of embodied difference. I have been involved in these, in these workshops for some time, first as a participator, then as an organizer, and then most recently after receiving facilitator training, I've become a facilitator of these workshops, helping, um, helping participants produce their final videos in a software called Final Cut Pro, which is a fairly user-friendly um, video editing software. 
One of the tasks that I help participants with is creating video splices. Those are exact cuts um, between two, two, two pieces of, of um, film footage and pairing this video up with audio. Both of these tasks require precision, which requires fine motor skills, which I, which I do not have because of my disability. My hands shake a lot, especially when I ask them not to, and, and this affects my, my ability to be precise when, when editing videos. In fact, my splices are not precise at all. And this lack of precision, my disability, shows up in the final, in the final video. Um, my, my shaky hands affect the aesthetics of that video. My difference, my different way of creating video could be oriented to in a few ways. It, my difference could be excluded. I could be asked not to come to these workshops, just not be a workshop facilitator at all, because I can't do one of the main tasks um, required of a facilitator. So it, my difference could be excluded. My difference, as neoliberalism loves to do, could also be tolerated. So I could be included um, as, a, as a workshop facilitator, but either implicitly or explicitly told that, one, that the role of, um, of helping people um, create their video was not something I was allowed to engage with. So that would be a way of sort of including me, but not, but not in a full way or not with desire. A third way, and happily, the way that I have been included in these video workshops is, is to include me in a way that desires my difference. So, so, and that allows me to help people with their video. You can't, I can't help people with their video and, and, that, and my difference go unnoticed. That's not a possibility. So if you include me, you're desiring the difference that my disability makes to that art, art form. And if we return to Sophie Sieber's initial definition of what aesthetics is, it's aesthetics is to be satiated by a form. Now when I make a video and when my shaky hands create shaky cuts to that video and and somebody decides that that video is finished or decides that that video is good, they're doing so through desiring the difference that my disability makes. And as far as I've gotten in my thinking, that is disability aesthetics. It's noting the difference and being satiated by that difference. Um, and then in an act that I rarely do, I'm going to show a video that I made. And, you know, consider yourselves. Lucky, but this, <laughs> this is a video that I made years ago, and like just had this video, I, you know, I have some amount of dis disidentification of this, but I think it is relevant because as I'm talking about how an aesthetic skin desire my disability, the thematic in this video describes the time when I was at art school and not quote unquote out as a disabled person. So noticeably different. Nobody was um, nobody was tricked into thinking I was a non-disabled person, but but I, I really um, distanced myself from that identity, and um, and that showed up in my artwork. So this is what the, the video is about, and I think it's interesting that it's about that the video is about me trying to exclude my disability from my art practice, and the form of the video, as you can see. Um, well, who knows? Hope maybe you'll um, judge it to be to be um, aesthetically pleasing or not. Oh, sorry. I have to fiddle with the captions. I think. Just give me one sec, the captions are in it.
when smaller and other topics was twenty to my system. Something a bit wonky with the sound. My phone and other topics was twenty to my system. Monkey, it's monkey, it's monkey. Like to the way the and then the way the foot way. I just try to read it. It's a dark thing. Why did you listen to the film when I was four? When small and dark colors, I was going to my system. I didn't know if I could put it all over me. Do you think of it? I chose the early morning to take a look. Okay, sorry, the sounds are a bit wonky, but there's captions, so we'll just do it. When small and dark colors, I was constantly my system. I didn't like to write a book for a living. And then what a book for a living. In the dark room, why did you listen to the film when I was four? It's just a different cross to the field. In different directions. And my sister and fall to the I chose the early mornings and late nights. You could start the hours and hours that you seem to complete this time. It took minutes for most to complete. The time I spent in the dark room stretched on the morning. Spread, but the hours that it took my wrinkled and mixed fingers became the point of spread. Through the eyes of three and three dust on my pillow. When I asked my room in the browsing studio to use the metal for me, I moved to incredibly fast. The quest for help made me sweat. The fault of my neck became fake water. My right arm swung to grasp the ring of my back. My voice quickly tampered out of my mouth. I stuttered slowly at the door. Chris tapped on my knee to wand to his staircase. The neighbor crept. Chris was with my body. Chris was my smile. The rest of the crowd came when he had a pair of his stairs with the six steps with the front of my crest. But it wasn't. There was an embarrassing rush between my desires and high of my disability as I moved around the school and needed to first explore. There was an ironic rush between my desires to represent the normal, simple, pleasant, beautiful body in my art and my glancing, stuck, never still body. Sensibilities, despite my best efforts, appeared in the splashes and photographs where I couldn't quite separate the rhythm in the dark. 
or not the remains on my bed and showed up in my rabbit tree when my fingers were just given up. When I finally decided the right possibility to go up and more than this was perfect. When I decided to pleasure my disability, now for a very soft part now. I felt this part was thrown up in my face, lumped in my throat. Then felt in my right arm that passed the rest of my thoughts. Every time I hear my voice, see my body, or any one of this, the way my face is touched. I feel the rush of being my own most unintended viewer. So the argument that I'm trying to advance with this. There's another video. I might just show it at the end because we still have to get to the storytelling, um, seven steps of digital storytelling. But it, that, um, I would say that um, if we're crip, mad, deaf, um, however we embody ourselves, is also how we embody our art practice. And because art practice is our um, usually or typically um, require an interaction between our bodies and material, I think the different ways that we live in our body is going to show up in how we create art. So again, we can, we can um, orient a disability as something that signifies a mistake, but I don't think that that will lead us very far into appreciating disability art. We can't orient, we can't ignore the difference that disability makes. It's going to show up. So, so I'm trying to think through how desiring the way that disability shows up might give us some insight into what, what disability art, aesthetics might be. Another, I think, quite important reason for theorizing disability aesthetics is so that we can open up the category of disability art to not only art which um, takes as a thematic the experience or representation of disability. Um, and the reason for this is because people's artistic practices develop, right? We, we change thematics, right? Um, and the other reason for this is because as we've been saying, the risk of representing our body might not be one that we feel like engaging um, at every point in our artistic career. Um, so I want to talk just briefly, here's Jess again, um, creating Freedom Tube, which is hung in the main um, lobby of the 401 Richmond Gallery during our um, Tangled Art Festival. And this, this is a piece of work by just um, and if you can see it, thousands of red and white bendy straws sewn together by um, with dental floss. And if just were here, they would tell you that the idea from um, the idea for this artwork, Freedom Tube, came from actually coincidentally when Jess and I were working together facilitating a digital storytelling workshop, and they walked in carrying a, co a coffee cup, and in the coffee cup was a straw, which is sort of a non-normative way to drink coffee through a straw. And they said to me, um, do you use straws to drink your coffee? And I said, Bach to Jess, you mean Freedom Tube. And Freedom Tube was a, a, a name that was given to straws by a group friend um, in Chicago. So, so uh, already I'm sort of um, mentioning a group culture. We have words, we have practices, and we have, um, we're, you know, geographically fast to communicate. This is a, how a culture gets passed on. Um, so we laughed about that. And then we started thinking about how 
Straws are much more than symbols about access, but they're actually icons of disability history. Again, I feel like I'm repeating this over and over again, but if we show up to anything, an art opening, a party, anything at all, a, le a luncheon, and we see straws on the table, whether or not we use straws to drink our drinks, it's, it symbols to us that um, our presence was anticipated. Somebody hoped that difference would show up to the room. So out of that story and the, the broader story of, of how straws function in disability culture and this sort of tongue-in-cheek nickname of Freedom Tube has created um, this, this Freedom Tube. And I think, I, 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 would, um, I don't think you can argue that this is disability art. It's talking about, it's representing an inside joke, so to speak. It's, it's honoring and paying tribute to um, something in disability culture. By talking about it, you're giving folks insight into what it might be like to be a crip and what, what crip practices might be like. So, so it does all of the things that, uh, at the beginning of the talk, how I describe disability art is produced by a disabled person. It references um, something about the experience of, dis of disability, though not explicitly. It's accessible. Um, you can touch it. So that's another way that we can disrupt um, normative conventions of not being allowed to touch work, but thinking about how different kinds of people may experience our work through touch. So for all of those reasons, again, I think this piece is disability art, and it also engenders a disability aesthetic. <clears throat> I was going to pause for another group dis discussion at this point, but let's, if it's OK with the group, we'll just move on in the interest of time. Um, Forgive my um, uneasy transition to the next part of the talk, digital storytelling. I was going to try to work it into something, but... So, we've been talking about, and so we've been talking about digital activism, and we've watched a few digital story guesses in mine, um, and maybe we'll get to watch one more. Um, but I, I think di digital storytelling isn't... Is in, 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 an emancipatory practice for disabled people for all the reasons that we've been talking about. It allows disabled people control over our own representation and it puts out multiplicity of representations of disability into the world. And for, for um, another reason, as we talk about a lot in our workshops, you can't, it's hard to argue with a story, I'm sure. Um, that point could be argued as well, but um, we can argue with how stories are taken up, but I think that we do, I would sort of put forth that we do have, um, we, we, um, there is something special about being, being allowed to tell a story. So digital storytelling was, um, emerged as a, as a practice um, in California. There's now a center for digital storytelling there. And I would say about the center, um, two things. One is they created digital storytelling at a time when video cameras and video editing technology was becoming more available and more user friendly. Um, through this idea that it might be a way to let folks who are marginalized um, tell stories in a way that they can easily share and easily sh circulate. So social justice is sort of at the core of, the, of digital storytelling. The other thing I would say about the center is it's, it's pretty good for sharing resources. You can download a lot of resources for free, including what they call a digital storytelling cookbook, which is a great, a great thing that they do. So if anyone's interested in thinking about holding digital storytelling workshop, they would um, encourage you to look through the resources for free online and also uh, talk to me. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, I think just quickly let's go, let's go over um, 
the seven steps of digital storytelling, just to give you um, some sort of insight into the basic overall structure of it and how it does center on stories. So the first step that they they ask you to do is to own your insight. And I will say at the outset that these are general structures. We can quit or queer or whatever we need to do with these structures. Sometimes, you know, sometimes, and lots of times people turn out to our workshops and they don't want to tell their story because their story has been told and taken up in ways that um, is used against them. I, I, I had one person in my in a workshop and she did not want to make a story and today her digital story was simply her reading out word for word of the Mental Health Act, which for her was the story she needed to tell. Um, so, but we can think about these as guidelines, but not rules, I guess. So owning our insight, finding our story, so what story do we, you want to tell? And the answer to that might be, I don't want to tell a story. Um, and as, as a facilitator, you need to work with that. Um, um, what do you think your story means? Clarifying your story. So we talked a lot about how we might have an overall story in our life, but one particular moment or scene in our life can, can um, clarify and represent that story really well. So one interaction might be able, or gesture might be able to tell a whole bigger story. Um, owning your emotions. Again, something we can take with a grain of salt, especially in disability and mad community, thinking about um, just complicating that a little bit. Yeah, you can die a little bit uneasy with these steps, but there you go. Um, uh, so, um, so emotional honesty, identifying emotion, finding a moment. I think I, I talked about that. Um, choosing the, the right moment um, that, you, that your story hinges on. And when I say I'm critical of these steps, I'm not at all critical of the practice of, of creating digital stories. And I think these steps are great guidelines. But you think about who's in the room and, and work with with that and create your own sort of way of um, teaching. Um, seeing, so thinking about how images shape your story, lots of times, as you see, just as especially used a bunch of different images to, to tell their story. Number five, I just never even pay attention to, it's hearing your story, so they, they um, suggest that you go on these free online music databases and download some music. I would really caution against that one. It does nothing to help, I don't think, unless the person is a musician. Um, assembling your story, um, and then sharing your story, which I think is one of the most important steps of this, this process is how and with whom you share the story. Do you put your story up on YouTube, or do you kick um, take care of that story and only show those people who you want to, to share with it. And I would really recommend that that's built into the structure through which you teach the storytelling or, or make your own, I guess, is be thinking about um, what kind, you know, we all don't want to share every story we have inside of us. Okay, I'm just going to skip a little bit through, but um, but I'm happy to uh, answer any questions about um, digital storytelling and at the end. So just because this is where it all comes together, I want to just take about five more minutes, if that's OK, three more minutes, um, talking about aesthetics as a way into the future. So <clears throat> some of you have heard this bit before, but maybe I'll hear it again. <laughs> So, you know, I've been thinking a lot about how um, disability is represented in terms of futurity. Um, and this brought me to thinking about Rod Metalko's written conversation with Frederick Jameson, in which um, Metalko says to Jameson, um, it's easier to imagine the end of the world in a different one. Um, so, yeah, it's a good quote. It's easier to imagine the end of the world than a different one. 
McElgo um, is thinking through the many ordinary, ordinary ways that our culture tells us that it's easier to imagine the end of a life than a life with and through difference. So in lots of ways, death is preferable to any kind of different kind of life or life with difference. Uh, thinking about disability and futurity also reminds me um, of last fall when I attended one of Toronto's A Thousand Dinners, um, a dinner conversation around the theme of accessibility held here at Ryerson, hosted by Melanie Panich and Heather Willis. Heather and Melanie hosted the dinner for a multi-generational group of dis disability activists. The topic of aging and disability came up as it does and will, will continue to do in light of the Carter decision. Um, someone who you may all be familiar with, Myra Lefowitz, asked longtime disability rights um, activist Tracy Adele um, how she thought the aging population in Toronto would benefit from the winds of disability rights. Um, so, and she said that she thought that the aging population would gain a more accessible city. And what disabled people in turn would gain from the aging population is greater access to, to, um, to death, right? So what we're giving as all, um, as we grow up, is access to life, a different kind of life, like a different way of getting around the city and what's being given back to us through legislation like physician, physician assisted suicide is greater access to killing ourselves to death. So the stakes are, are high, right? Um, I also think, I also think through um, a brief conversation that activist Eli Clare has um, when he talks about being at a, at a protest called Not Dead Yet, which is protesting similar legislation to the Carter decision in the States. And he remembers seeing a young boy named Sean with CP, much like Claire, um, much like his own. Um, and he's wearing a crip cool cap, he's riding a power chair, and he's at a protest with a bunch of other crips this six-year-old disabled boy. Um, and Claire, Claire says as he watches Sean, he says Sean could have been another Tracy Latimer, a 12-year-old girl with cerebral palsy, um, killed by her father who said he did it to him to end his her unbearable suffering. Claire is articulating with such, such succinct power um, how community appears when death so easily could have. And I think art and disability community also appear, uh, always appears where death could have and always resists the hold that um, the, the description of disability lives as unlivable has over, over all of our lives, um, disabled and not. So in, in so many ways, disability is culturally rendered as undesirable and a sight of no future. Um, but Monsieur submits that art can be a disruptive act that can reconfigure our world. So if we think about disability art as, as putting forth this idea that being disrupted by disability is not only okay, but it's desirable, then that gives us greater access to disability life. We, we can um, reference disability art as engendering a, a cultural desire for disability that I'm sure will carry us into the future. Thanks a lot. Eliza for uh, such an interesting and, and uh, really intellectually and aesthetically stimulating talk. 
Um, we've got about uh, 20 minutes for uh, Q&A and discussion. Um, I'm sure uh, you have questions or comments or um, um, things you want to say for Eliza. So, um, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start, uh, start us off with a question. Um, I really, I welcomed your comments at the end about the relationship between age and disability, and um, I was wondering um, if you could talk about where, I mean, you did talk a bit about how age and disability can learn from one another, but, but where do they intersect as, um, as a political or a social movement, or even as an aesthetic practice? I mean, a lot of the, the work that you showed was amazing, but I, it, um, I noticed it was mostly younger artists, so it's a yeah, nice question yeah. for me. And I, yeah, thank you for that. I think the way that aging and disability communities connect, um, well, in, in lots of different ways, but one, one way important to this talk is how both are represented as lacking vitality or, or maybe more aptly losing vitality, right? So I think that when we, there is something to the way that we imagine um, disabled, or sorry, anyone who, who sort of is standing on the precipice of life as not being interested or not having time or not being desired as artistic audiences, right? So, so I mean, this, this is, has always been the case where we imagine art as in sort of a, a pastime of the middle or, or upper classes. So I think that's, that's one thing is, is uh, in, in relation to art where um, disability and aging communities connect. I think it's, it's a really interesting discussion to think about how aging can be theorized through um, disability studies and vice versa. And these are two disciplines that I don't think have, have um, intersected that much, but, but, they, but this intersection is emerging. And I would say um, Dr. Audre Cole, who many of you might know as an artist informed researcher working in OISI, is now working at the Nova Scotia Center for Aging and thinking about art in relation to aging. So there is something about how art, access to art connects us. Um, so I would say these communities aren't as sort of aligned as they could be, but I wonder about um, through gaining representation, um, which confronts um, stereotypic understanding that both disabled and aging bodies as lacking vitality might be one place where they can come together. Um, yeah, so thank you again for speaking. It's really great. Um, so I saw in your PowerPoint, or like in the Prezi, how you included like how the disability movement kind of took off like along the same time as other movements, um, like other civil rights movements. So how like how does racial, um, like how does race like intersect with like disability? Like where do you see that fitting in? Because that all that, that all happened like the same movement. Like, the civil rights movement was happening too, and so was the women's movement and the queer movement. So many other movements. How how do those intersect when it comes like disability? Yeah, in lots of ways, lots of interesting ways. Um, so, um, something that I didn't touch on was the difference between disability rights and disability justice. So, disability rights um, was it, it is um, discursively aligned with a human right with human rights model. So, to to suggest that disability rights are human rights. But the framework that human rights allows for is that you can only have access to laws and legislation if you're recognized as a citizen. Um, 
The disability rights movement has lots of interesting ties with the civil rights movement. Um, the, the Black Panthers were a group, a group of people in, in Oakland, California, who really taught disability activists how to, how to form a movement and supported disability activists in their movement. But that's a history that doesn't often get talked about. So what we see happening is because of how disability rights are defined as, you know, we need access into spaces and how we imagine in, in access to spaces um, beginning and ending with physical barriers um, and not acknowledging the loss of other, uh, other systems of repression keep us out of spaces or um, that, that we see a very white lead and a white um, a white disability rights community. Um, in reaction to that, in Oakland, California, in about the 1980s came this disability justice movement. And if you're interested in me, Mingus writes a lot of blogs. Do you know me, Mingus? Yes, okay. So she writes a lot of, uh, lots of blogs about um, why, she, why she and others I'm probably telling you stuff you already you know, but why she and others created the disability justice movement, and both in 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 feeling alienated by by the white movement, and also in recognition that that um, a justice movement um, imagines um, lots of intersecting points of oppression that's keeping us out of spaces. So. Um, just because we can get into a university lecture hall, if our bodies are not read as knowledge producers, then then we don't have access to that space of the, those spaces. Also, I think what happens is um, to mobilize language of accessibility to assert your rights um, to get access to a space. I I I think, and I found this in my own experience. Um, that so that requires you to understand yourself as, as someone who deserves to be in that space. So it sort of hinges on privilege in a way, right? It, it makes you, if I, if I imagine myself as someone who deserves to be in a university classroom, then I can mobilize disability legislation to make sure I can get into that classroom. If I have never seen myself in a place of power, a position of power, whatever, um, or not, no, let me be first. If, if I'm not recognized as someone who deserves to be in those spaces, then I might have a much tougher time mobilizing um, that language of, of race-based discourse. And all, I mean, the, the whole thing hinges on the fact that, you know, we're not all citizens in the country where we live, right? So, so that, that makes a huge difference to who has access to a, a rights-based discourse. So um, disability justice, I think, is much more aligned with the projects that I'm sort of crafting out because it understands that justice um, doesn't only come from um, barrier-free environments, but around how we conceive of um, disabled people and, and, and multiple ways of representing disability. Um, and one final quick note is, well, I'll leave it in fact. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the reading that we got this week in our class to kind of prepare for this lecture uh, was examining um, the correlation between uh, disability and performance. And one of the things that it points out in the article is um, that under the term disabled, it kind of groups in a multiple of people. It says wheelchair users, people with chronic pain conditions, mental health system, etc. They're all kind of put under the term disabled, as well as it points out that women have been constructed as less rational, black people as more animal-like. So what I kind of drew from these, uh, these two parts of the article is that oppression often begins with words and definitions and how we understand things through language. Do you think that, do you, sorry, um, <laughs> do you think that to kind of solve this problem of oppression through words, is redefining um, something like the way that you say crip, you redefine that. Do you think it's the 
the way that you solve that problem is through redefining, or do you think it's through completely finding new terms for it? I just want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question and a complicated question. So I think what you're raising, is, well, the first thing that you've raised, which is important to know, is that um, disability is a category of people. Disability is also a label that's been imposed on other groups of people because it's understood as being a justifiable means of exclusion, right? So we can think about immigration policy in which, um, you know, um, sort of in the late 19th century where immigrants were let in based on their ability to work, you know, to labor, if, if an immigrant was um, not understood as, as being able to labor in an effective way, then their body was described as being disabled, regardless of whether they themselves had, had an impairment. And, and that was a way to keep them out, because at that time, race was not a justifiable means of exclusion, but disability was and still is, right? So, so that's one thing. And, and I mean, uh, I don't know, it's, it's very complicated, this, this question about um, language. And, I, I think that the important difference is I, I try to always use the three um, deaf-disabled deaf, and mad-identified folks because although those communities um, at times are in intensely connected, I think it goes back to what we were saying about disability justice, the way that um, our bodies have been oppressed and, and violated and excluded oftentimes um, it's, it's through different means. So, so there might be um, some political importance to think about but how can we, how can we create um, um, a bad positive space and just have that as our overall sort of um, aim for this particular part of the movement? How can we mobilize um, understanding the deafness of the language and not a disability? Right, so and that contradicts to what the disability movement is trying to mobilize, which is um, disability is something we can celebrate and be and be proud of. So, and I, I mean, it's it's a trick with words, right? And I don't know how much sort of meaning to to imbue words with. I mean, disability is certainly a word that irks a lot of people, and I think it confuses a lot of people. Um, you, you, you know, I always hear, oh, this flash ability and, you know, all that stuff. And I think through claiming the word even disability and then crip, of course, we're not, you know, we're sort of infusing that word um, with, with the new meaning, I guess. So, as Amy Linton would say, we're reassigning meaning to, to those words. And I think we have the right to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was phenomenal. Uh, the question that I, I have and I want you to talk about is uh, concerning the digital stories um, sort of format and rubric and the state of affairs with accessibility to filmmaking. So digital stories work as a, a type of filmmaking, if, if we will. And for instance, it's, it maybe has a, an independent form where one is telling their own story, perspective, their own construction in this mini doc form, for instance. Uh, but part of the work I'm doing with Adam Cahoon, who you obviously know, uh, is thinking about ways of accessibility for uh, artists with disabilities who maybe don't only want to tell their own personal stories, but want to make like a, a Hollywood slasher film or whatever in between. So I just want you to talk about the accessibility for artists with disabilities to the, the broader range of filmmaking. So it's not just you in your room, you know, doing a slideshow or something like that, but going into the more conventional forms and just accessing to the, the different forms of that. Yeah, that's a good question, one that I know that you're well familiar with. Um, and I think Adam, Adam Kuhn, who was here earlier, his work is so um, powerful, I think, because he takes, he takes he's a photographer, uh, a chair user, and 
one of the things that he does with his art practices is he takes photographs of art galleries that he can't get into, right? Because of, of, of steps. Um, so I think in lots of ways we're not only excluded from art making, but participating in an arts culture, right? We're also excluded from accessing arts funding. So I think, you know, I would say that dis disabled artists are as diverse as anything, but one thing that connects us is how our art practice has been affected by um, inaccessibility to anything, um, including making slasher films. So I, I think where our cultural imagination falls short is thinking of, uh, is thinking of physical accessibility. And there are so many tech, new technologies right now, I can't even imagine it, but you know, if you can move your eyeballs, you can create music, right? So, I mean, the technology is there. So, impairment is not, a, is no longer a relevant, um, we can't, we can't be told that we don't have the ability to make artwork. And, and whenever anyone brings that up, I always throw back at them the example of Andy Warhol, who didn't make any of his own artwork, right? So, so, I mean, physical accessibility is a barrier, but, there, but that barrier certainly does not exist with one's ability, but with their access to uh, technology. Um, but also, I think, access to um, the theater spaces, right? To, like, how can we enter into an artistic canon that we don't have access to? How can we represent ourselves as entering into a disability artistic canon when that art canon is is not is not um, available for, or, or not popularized enough for people people to know, and why isn't it popularized enough? It's because how do we access disability art in in a mainstream way? Um, so I mean, I would encourage anyone, and I'm, I'm sure you know Mark Hassel at the at the Ontario Arts Council is the media arts officer, and he he's so committed to um, giving media artists with disabilities access to funding, technology, and critique, which is a major one. Lots of disabled artists don't have access to critique through this idea that, that you know, if we have to produce art that is relevant, that's, that's the best we can hope for. When, when we know as, as professional artists that we have, um, the ability to, to develop like anyone else, um, but with that critique and encouragement. Um, am I answering your question? Do you, you, want to? you are, but I, I guess I also think about it in, a, in another practical, pragmatic sense of, uh, I conceptually am totally with yeah, you, yeah. but like if you are this person and you go through, uh, like a, an artist with disability, and you go through these um, sort of established channels of the Arts Council and so forth for funding, that's still, in a way, not giving you the access to the conventional forms of like a post-production house or other filmmakers who have their, their normalized, able mode. Yeah. And, and that's, like a, I think, a, a current disjuncture. I mean, it's the normalized way. And I think this is kind of what we're developing moving forward is uh, working in, in alliance. But I also kind of want to see your take and, and like what else is happening. And what if you are someone like Adam who wants to make movies? Where do you go to meet someone like me or someone from here? Etc. Or I mean, maybe it's right here, but is that it? Yeah. I think your friend in the back has the answer. I'm Thank you. Uh, one of the yeah, one of my friends who was going to come here, unfortunately, couldn't be here. She runs an organization called Lights Camera Access, yeah. and she's in she's in a wheelchair. She has MS. She's an actor, actor, and she represents. Uh, a couple of hundred uh, people with disab disabilities who wish to be in the film industry and some are actively engaged as camera people, lighting people, actors. And she has training sessions with a lot of support from organizations like the Toronto uh, Film Studios that offer space and uh, lessons in filmmaking. Uh, so it's a wonderful organization and you know, they are quite mainstream, and, and that's the intent to uh, break down the barriers there and provide greater accessibility for all kinds of artists. 
And there's a connection with the arts camera attitude in the Ontario OMDC. On yes, yeah. yeah. She, she, she is, in fact, uh, a member of the Ontario um, um, Media Development Corporation, and that's why she came to here. She had an OMDC meeting. So that's, that's a good connection, Lisa Levinson. Thanks for being with us tonight. Um, for our class, the social justice media class, we read an article by, I believe, a uh, man called Hayes and a woman called Black, who talked about mostly representation of disabled people in film. Mm -hmm. um, and they talked about a discourse of pity, which I think you know we're all pretty familiar with um, as it, when it comes to disabled people. Um, and their solution, their idea for <coughs> how film could move forward and break this discourse of pity was by representing, they want, it was a big long essay, but by representing um, having more people in, more people with disabilities in films who are not there because of their disability, who are just characters who happen to be disabled, who it's more about their character than about their disability. Um, but I think what you were talking about almost contrasts that in that you talk about desire and almost a discourse of desire. And I'm wondering if that, does that clash with their idea of better representation and how can we make this discourse of desire maybe more mainstream? How can we bring this discourse of desire out in art, I guess? That's an excellent question. And you're sort of picking up on my um, political bent there. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, like we were just talking about like, my position in Tangled is to represent any artist with a disability. My political motivation for being in Tangled is because I desire disability, and I, 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 I like art that, that, that is political, right? So, but, I mean, there is a way to do both, and I think one of the ways to do both to desire disability and also open up opportunity for disabled theater actors, etc., is to again change the art psychology. So I don't think it's only about including disabled actors. It, I mean, it's not no offense to the, the author of the article, but do you imagine that we can include a wheelchair user in any role? Isn't that creative? I think we we can be a hell of a lot more creative than than that, right? Is that the author in that? <laughs> oh, someone just looked at me. The author's not here, right? <laughs> I had a moment of panic. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, it's been a long day. Um, but I, so I think it's about hiring uh, folks from within the disability community to think, to create scripts, to write in characters and roles, and to imagine that one's experience of disability might, might give some artistic insight to how that script and how that character is written and developed, right? It's about creating, um, so, so in that way we can think about how, um, yeah, I guess I'm caught in your question. To me, to me, disability art isn't about including di disabled people in normative ways. To me, disability art is crippling or troubling or disrupting um, our ecology altogether. And, and included in that can be creating slasher films and artists and, and um, actors with disabilities whose disability isn't explained through the script. Um, but I think it, 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 all of that um, requires us to desire disability in every step of the artistic production, from, from creating scripts to costume making. I think, I mean, that would be a really interesting thing to think about how, how theater costumes get created. Um, in, in a way that desires disability. So I think desiring disability um, can sort of motivate all kinds of changes that need to happen, whether it's legislative, creative, etc.
Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much, Eliza, for a wonderful talk and discussion. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and uh, look forward to seeing you on October 20th at our next event.